So, the Junicol in quick. Now, why have I put this here? Why have I done this rather than normal UAD video? Or other thing using various technologies? Well, for starters, I'm still working on what system I'm going to be using for next year and procuring that system, and it's probably going to depend on the tower system I get or build. And secondly, this. A comment from Poatsky, which was, do you have content about this French new school, or je ne colle? Context. I'm wondering what he's talking about at the beginning of the video. Now, I, this confused me, because I was going, I've done this in lots of videos, and I thought, well, I'll type je ne colle, because perhaps that will, it will come up. And no, it didn't come up. And I realized that whilst I've probably done a lot about the Junicol in various strategic discussion videos, um, but it, videos on torpedo boats, on torpedoes, on battleships, on the various naval races in the 1890s, etc., I haven't done an actual video which is entitled and all focused on the Junicol. So I thought I set myself up a challenge. Can I do this in 30 minutes or less? Now, some of you are going to go, but Alex, that's way too short. You'll die. No, I will manage it. I will manage it, but I will need to recharge my iron brew studios. So, excuse me while I talk while refilling an iron brew bottle. The Junicol is one of those interesting schools. It's the question I would like you to be thinking about while we're going through this, and I'll attempt to answer at the end, is whether the Junicol is or is not the first example of an offset strategy. And by offset strategy, I mean something which seeks to use technology to offset traditional military advantage. Now, anyone who's a student of history will know that actually, as a rule, what happens is that for a short while, the technology provides an offset, and then it itself gets incorporated into the traditional military advantage, or in a more traditional military form, and so then becomes the guarantor of the normalcy. That's traditionally what happens with technology. And the Junicol is kind of living proof of this, because the Junicol goes through many phases and keeps going, because it's such a nice idea to use technology to offset power, especially the power of Britain for the French, but more importantly, to do it cheaply so they can focus on the army, because they're huge land borders. And when you have one of the great powers of the period obsessed with something, other powers look into it. Especially when that great power is particularly good at propaganda and at talking about themselves and about explaining very loudly how right they are. Usually in long treaties. Very long treaties. Massively long treaties. Anyway, Junicol, as you expect with, the, uh, with a French school, starts with a general. Uh, Henry Joseph Pythans. Pythans. Um, I've received two different instructions on how to pronounce it. I'm probably going to mangle both. One comes from one of my best friend's French girlfriend, so may or may not be correct, and the other one comes from a French teacher who I know. And both of them are likely to wind me up, so we'll, we'll hope I'm right. If I'm wrong, please correct me. Anyway, he is declared the prophet of high explosive. He is one of the first people who comes up in 1860 with this explosive shell gun that can be used on battleships, can be used on ships. His first idea is, this is a brilliant idea. What we can do is we can put these shell of these guns on small steamships and then they can destroy traditional battleships. Great. That's a good idea, but hang on. Um... I'm just going to say this out loud there. If you're, you're basically your idea to offset ships with a large number of guns, which are made of wood, is to put a small number of guns on a ship which is made of steel and powered by steam or has iron armor. Yes. Can you not see where this might go? Because isn't it just going to change the race to be seeing who has the most powerful ship with armor and steam now? And number of cannon? This is the problem with an offset strategy at its base point. You can reset the system, but the system tends to automatically start to grow. Because a little something is powerful, more of it's going to be even more powerful. That's the obvious conclusion. And yes, whilst you might be an innovator and a wonderful thinker, most people are copiers. And they just take your idea and they just make it bigger. 
So he goes around the world to start saying, well, you know, we can use this high explosive. This can destroy things. You know, it's great. It's great. And it leads to various scenarios, including one can argue Gloar and Warrior and all those ships coming out. Although they were already coming along anyway. Because of the technology was moving along that way. But it does create a bit of a revolution of sorts. Anyway, now. As said, ultimate problem with this idea is that you just keep building bigger versions of those new ships. And so it doesn't really work as an offset strategy. The technology's not there. However, uh, this doesn't bother Admiral Hyacinth Laurent Fiofier Ulb, who is French Minister of Marine from January the 7th, 1886 to May the 30th, 1887. And whilst there, he temporarily stops construction of battleships. And this might sound not like a major problem, but actually it does cause a major problem because if you stop construction of ships in the middle of their build and you send people away and have them do other things, then the people who come in afterwards who come to restart them are probably not the same people who are working on them because they were off doing other things. And you end up with a lot of discontinuity and you end up with a generation of very bad ships. And a generation of very bad ships can lead to a lot of further problems. Now, the Juno Coal by this point has evolved. It started to head towards a different system here of weaponry, especially. It's no longer focusing on the high explosive gun, although it does still consider rapid guns and high explosive guns useful. No, no, no. It has found a new weapon. The torpedo! Woohoo! We got a torpedo. And the whole idea is again your little ships can sink gigantic battleships with their, their torpedoes. So these very cheap things. Firing something which is even cheaper can sink something which is massively expensive. That is the idea. That is the great idea. And there are lots of developments along this pro uh, this process. Um, they had various points at which they felt they were validated. Uh, this in there's a Chilean battleship being engaged. Um, there was particularly the French Navy fighting the Chinese Navy during the second, uh, the Sino-French War of 1883 to 1885 was supposed to validate entirely the idea of torpedo boats against conventional navies. There is one small problem here, and I would like to point this out. The French doctrine is entirely predicated on fighting the British. Now, I have great respect for the Chinese Navy in the 1880s. They try to accomplish a lot in a very short amount of time. They have very committed people. They try to hire in the best they can, build the best they can, and they end up with a hodgepodge fleet, which is frankly weird as anything. The fact that they put up the fight they do is amazing under the circumstances and infrastructure that supports them. However, they are not the British Navy of the 1880s. They are nowhere near the Royal Navy of the 1880s. They're just not. So success against them is basically saying, well... A world, a first rank power in the world who has probably a second or third rank navy, depending on, you know, second or third rank navy in the world compared to others, possibly the second, managed to win against the power which was not a first rank power in the world by this point in terms of military firepower, and a navy which was nowhere near the top 50 in reality. That's that's not good. That's not a validation of your success or your capabilities. That's a... Uh, we bootstomp someone. Really? You won? I'm so surprised. But it is taken as a great and glorious victory and proof of the system. So, of course, the French double down. Um, they double down by going to torpedo boat, uh, to the other... Uh, a generation torpedo boat, the submarine especially. Now, this point, of course, does not happen in isolation. Why are they going with the submarine, starting to push the submarine? Because some sod, some little sod, A, has built a British torpedo boat, and then the British have come up with this thing called the Torpedo Boat Destroyer, which is a slightly larger vessel. Again, they just keep growing in size. Uh, which carries torpedoes as well, so can be used as a torpedo boat, but also carries rapid-firing guns to sink your torpedo boats. 
and they're also putting rapid firing guns on their capital ships, which can sink your torpedo boats. Sods. Why will they not stand still and accept defeat? Why do they continue to evolve? Welcome to the world of natural technology and history and how it develops. It's nothing ever takes place in isolation and there is always a reaction to whatever you do. It doesn't happen in quiet. It isn't a case of we have developed the technology, we have therefore won, war is over. At no point does someone develops a counter or something else which can be used to mitigate it and then you're in trouble. France often declared as having the first navy to having an effective submarine force. In fact, my own old prof, Andrew Lambert, puts that out there. And this is in part because the French are obsessed with getting the Junicole to work. And because, again, submarines are considered very cheap at this point. Um, let's be honest, most of the people's lives in them are expendable. When you're considering the small number of crew in a submarine versus the large number of crew in a larger ship. And especially at the beginning of the 1900s, how do you sink a submarine? You ram it? They're still developing the whole idea of depth charges, etc. And there's, of course, no sonar or uh, really or ASDIC or anything out there. There are hydrophones starting to come up appear, and there are minefields. But most of your defense against submarines are, at this point, especially with their torpedo arms, are passive. It's having torpedo protection. And, again, those annoying things that torpedo boat destroyers, which become known as destroyers, also become rather good at hunting down submarines. Just annoying. However, there is another small problem with the Juno Coal, and they realise this quite early on, because you can use those small steamships with their high explosive guns, or torpedo boats or submarines to sink the enemy battle fleet, which is what they're supposed to do. The idea was that the enemy battle fleet would come charging on to your small ships and then would be wiped out. They would not try and think of a counter. They would not try and dodge. They would not try and do any of the things which would be sensible to do. They would just stupidly come straight at you where you had your mass flotillas of whatever you were going to attack with and you could destroy them. And once the battle fleet was destroyed, what did you have to do? Well, winning a war against the maritime power is a lot more than just destroying their battle fleet. You need to destroy their commerce. And this is where you come up with the Dupi de Lome. So the Junicole comes up, uh, basically comes hand in hand with a Gerda course, with economic warfare. And therefore, I would often argue that the Junicole is more about phase one of an economic war of maritime econo economic warfare than it is an actual strategy but we'll get into that at the end so these become the big ships the really important big ships of the french they need to have long range they need to have the firepower to engage mainly merchant vessels because you know What else is there going to be left after the battle fleet has been wiped out? What else is there going to be left? <sighs> the problem for the French and the problem for the Junicole as a whole comes down to the fact that other people react to it. You've got Jackie Fisher in the UK who looks at the Junicole and goes, that's a great idea, but not as a replacement for a battle fleet. As a defensive force that's going to hold up an enemy, enemy forces attacking your country to buy time for your battle fleet to come down and kill them. Mm-hmm. He can afford to fund both. He does. That's why Britain has such a large submarine army in World War One. That's why Britain has so many torpedo boats and torpedo... Uh, and torpedo, let's be honest, destroyers in World War One. Because Jackie Fisher go, looks at the Juno Cole and goes, Hmm. How you're trying to apply this idea is stupid, but the idea itself is quite good. And that's 
the base problem with the junior college as a school. Really, the idea, the uh, using technology to allow a mass production of small, relatively expendable craft that can offset the advantage and undermine the superiority of larger enemy formations and larger enemy vessels to the point to which they have to counter them and have actually these to present a risk is a useful advantage. However, if you then do not have your own major capital assets that can fight the proper uh, fight a full le a full length battle, I. If you just rely on small torpedo boats to attack a battleship, okay, that's problematic, and the more there are as against a single battleship, the more problematic it gets. But if you're against a group of battleships and they realize you have torpedo boats and they are armed with many rapid firing small caliber guns to defend against these torpedo boats then suddenly your torpedo boats are less of a threat they become a single axis of threat however if you have your own battleships let's say you have two of them and the enemy has four. But you have two dozen torpedo boats. Suddenly, your enemy cannot do their normal thing of going, well, we have two to one advantage about battle we can focus. No, because they've got to deal with torpedo boats coming from different angles as well. So they're going to be distracted, which allows your battleships to focus their fire. You could still lose the battle, but the enemy losses will be far greater. And they might well be deterred from actually fighting because they might decide that, frankly, this is going to be too risky. We have to come back with our own destroyer escort. And, of course, that is what really does happen. In, in the end, you have both sides having destroyers, having torpedoes, having rapid-firing guns, and engaging. And you're fighting a full fleet battle. And now that offset strategy is part of the actual main fighting strategy. This is a good book. Juno Cold, Strategy of the Week by Arne Mahond. Very interesting read. It is roughly 130 quid on Amazon at that moment. And it really was the first offset doctrine. It was not a strategy. And this is the this is the point. A strategy is about how you think about an entire thing, you know. I would say Gear de Course, economic warfare, that's a strategy. It's a strategy of the week, but it's a strategy. Um the Juno Cole is more of a doctrine to me. It's the idea of we're going to use small, cheap things to offset the larger, more expensive thing. The problem comes when you are just going, we will only have the small, cheap things. It's a nice idea on paper, but in practice it always gets and runs into trouble because usually the large people who have large, expensive things will invest in working out a counter to the small, cheap thing. Or will take your idea, your great idea, and turn it against you. One of the first proper torpedo boats was British. Torpedo boat destroyers were British. Why were they producing them? In co well, watching on the French. There is a reason that the supreme example of firepower produced in 1900. Well, laid down 1905, launched 1906, commissioned 1906. HMS Dreadnought, famous because she has all main battery, right? She's first ship, which is all focused on just the big guns. Really? She has 10, 12 inch guns, yes, in five twin turrets. Yeah. She also has 27. Single 12 pounder, that's 76 mil or three inch guns, festooned around her. 27. Can't think why she was carrying those. Why would she be, you know, she's supposed to be an all, the first all big gun battleship, and she's carrying all these 12 pounder guns. Why? Oh, wouldn't be for dealing with torpedo boats, would it?
it doesn't make the Junicol bad. It does. Uh, what makes the Junicol bad is the way the French, uh, uh, the French especially, but to extent some other nations as well, uh, and other nations as well, apply it. They put all their eggs in one basket. Which is also why historians tend to worry whenever we hear people saying, oh, we need to put all our eggs in one basket today. If you hear someone coming in and telling you they have a wonder system, it's going to revolutionize warfare and all warfare will now be according to this. They're probably very good salespeople. They might not be, they won't be telling you the truth. Now, there are some things which are universal. For example, if you control the high ground, that does tend to help. As poor Obi-Wan tried to tell Anakin. And Anakin tried to tell Obi-Wan. It helps, but if you put on a nice piece of high ground and you're nice and high, a nice and high ground, nice castle, looking strong, feeling powerful, and someone turns up with artillery and can fire at you from a long way away, then you might well be hired on them. But your high ground just allows you to see where they're firing at you from if you don't have anything to respond to them with. Humans are inventive, industrious creatures. And where there's a problem, they tend to try and think of a solution. The Junicole... Yeah, I've, I've gone through several of its problems, but its problems basically list off as... One, your opponent is supposed to stay static. Two, it's putting all your eggs in one basket. And three... It ultimately comes from perspective that you are always smarter than your opponent. And your opponent will do the dumb thing. Which is never a good idea in war. But still, the French were obsessed with the Junicole, and many architects, many of their authors, many of their engineers tried to make it work, because from an engineering perspective, it is a technological solution to the problem of war. And that is attractive. If you have ever met some really really good engineers or really good scientists or people often who are really good in any part of their field in any field they will often presume that because they are massively capable in their field they can solve the problems in every other field it's rarely the case it's rarely life is so simple. Which is why it's good when you've got some people who are, um, how do I put this? Jacks of all trades. They tend to understand the difficulties in multiple fields. But leaving that to one side, the other interesting thing about the Junicole is I would argue it starts off the actual theoretical race between the, uh, the French and the Italians. And I would argue it's the writings of the Junicole which inspire people like Vittorio Canabetti and others to push various ideas forward. Which is one of the most interesting things that comes out of it. Right. That's in roughly 25 minutes. So, what have we got coming? Well, this week we have, once I've finished the painting, uh, Kirov class. And, yeah, we have patron... A patron is live. So, please, if you have any ideas, 
well, not ideas, it's devoted live, but if you have ideas for August, they'll be going live at some point soon as well. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care, and hope you're having fun. Hope you enjoyed. Quick introduction to the Junicol.